Hi, I'm Joe McDonald and this is Big Match Battle Vlog. So, um, this little video is going to be about me and TBIs and also what I think Ukraine needs and what the general situation is. So we have a new commander who kind of was already our commander. Uh, I think a lot of civilians um, and journalists, it would seem, don't really understand how an army works, you know. So, uh, in the Second World War, you had Eisenhower, but he was in charge of everything, right? And the coordination between all the different branches. And that's essentially what Zaluzhny was. But the commander of the army, for a long time, has been... St St Starsky, Starisky, I don't know how to pronounce the new boss's name, but yeah, it was that guy, and um, he appeared, you know, he's got what you might call a mixed, um, a mixed history, he was in charge of the defence of Kiev, which went very well, he was also in charge of the Kharkiv counteroffensive, which was a modern military masterpiece, I mean, I was there for that, Anyone who says that the Russians, that there weren't many Russians there and they didn't fight back, like, is just talking out their arse, you know. They, he successfully coordinated the movement of a vast amount of troops without the Russians knowing, and then we steamrolled them, you know. I mean, I was there getting strafed by fighter planes and stuff, so, you know, it, and friends of mine died in that battle. The Legion fought very, very hard in that battle, you know. I was just detailed to go and uh, provide security for a mobile artillery unit with a few other guys, and no one attacked us. So, you know, but we did nearly die from artillery once or twice, so, you know. But he, he was in charge of all of that. But then he was put in charge of, you know, as I mean, he's the general of the ground forces of Ukraine. Um, so he was in charge of Batmot. Now, whose actual decision it was to do Bakhmut the way it was done, I don't know. But Bakhmut was a was a meat grinder, you know. Um, we you hear about you know Russian meat assaults, right? But we do that too, and we do that because we have to do that when the enemy has got more guns and more tanks and an air force and you don't and they throw a load of men at a position the only thing you can do is to also throw men to defend into that position to defend it so the casualties are, were horrific and apparently he got the name butcher there now some research online and some people have told me that that name only appeared in um December of 2023, so it could be like Russian propaganda. One person has told me, heard some Azov guys referring to him that way back in September last year, but I don't know. But anyway, that's the new boss, you know. And then, as you know, the other day, Advika fell finally, and uh, at least he decided to pull out and defend from a second line as opposed to just pour more and more men into that place so maybe he's not as bad as the rumors would have now it would appear you know they haven't moved many divisions around yet but uh i've got a feeling that the hammer's going to fall down here next that the the orcs are going to focus on robertine and cranky and then maybe if they're stupid enough even try and retake curse on i mean they haven't got a a bridge to do it at the moment but they do have some serious amphibious capability um and if they landed 10 15 thousand guys in curse on and created enough of a, a beachhead they might be able to uh get armour and artillery and tanks across into the city and um, then we'd have some serious problems. In between 
uh, Mikolaev and Kherson, the building pretty significant defences right now. So it looks like I'm not the only one who's expecting something to happen. But it hasn't happened yet. I've been right about quite a lot of things in this war and wrong about some others. So we'll see. Um, so that's the general general review of our new general and the tactical situation. As for me, yeah, I'm not doing that good, you know. Um, I have some days where I feel normal. And like a few days ago, we went out training and I felt fucking great. I felt great from the morning all the way to the afternoon, all the way to the evening. Felt normal again. It's like, oh, right, okay, the TBI thing's gone. And the next day, it wasn't like that at all. And it wasn't like that the day after that, you know, I've wake up depressed with a headache. Doesn't fucking matter how much water I drink or how good my diet is or whether I take paracetamol or ibuprofen or not. Like I, it's, you know, I'm, I, I can't. Like a, a few weeks ago, I was really working hard on the book and I wrote like 15,000 words in, in like a two week period. And, you know, the book's getting up to date with with almost up to date with, with the current timeline. Um, the last couple of weeks since, since the TBI really bit in, I, I haven't done anything. Um at all and I just the computer's there on my desk and I uh in my room well I say desk little little camping table I've got in my room and um yeah you know um some of the charities and NGOs that have been contacting me to organise things over the the last days you know like I just I just forget what I've been told, I'll have a conversation with them and I'll make notes and then I'll forget about that conversation and I'll forget that I've made notes and nothing will happen. You know, I had to call, Brandon called me the other day to talk to me about something, about an organisation that wants to help my brigade. And I was like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, that sounds great. And then it like, about nine that, you know, he called me about midday and about nine that evening I was like, Brandon called. I think he said that there is a person who wants to speak to me about something. And that was the sum total of what I could remember. So, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, part of me feels a bit pathetic, like, complaining about this situation. You know, there's... um. A lot of guys in this war, a lot of guys who have had much, much worse injuries. You know, they've lost legs, limbs, eyes. They've got, you know, they've been hit in the skull by shrapnel and are like properly brain damaged, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, at some level, this is something that's really, really frightening me. Like, I, I think... At least, I don't know how I'd feel if it actually happened, but in my own head, I could handle losing a limb or an arm, you know, a leg or an arm, more than I could handle looking normal, but being 50% the man I was mentally, you know, not being able to think anywhere near as quickly as I used to and not being able to handle the stress of, stress of other people. Like, you know, I can just about handle having the dog at the moment. The idea of trying to manage a small business and or trying to even spin as many plates as I did a couple of months ago when I was working on the, uh, like, dealing with multiple, multiple charities and NGOs all the time and trying to get all this hate, help. And, you know, you're spinning... 10 or 15 conversational and negotiational plates all the time. I couldn't couldn't do that right now. It would just make me angry and stressed and confused and hopeless really quickly. 
So, yeah, you know, um, PTSD doesn't seem to seem to affect me too much, but um, but yeah, this this TBI thing has, and all I can hope is that it gets better because what am I meant to do? Like break my contract, go back to Europe or England? So there are some people who are like, oh, you could come and stay with me, but, you know, you know I got one sock? Someone gave someone a puppy for Christmas, and I'm sure they loved the idea. You know, they loved the idea of having a puppy. And then it was annoying and stressful and shit on the floor and barked when they didn't want it to bark, so they chucked him out. And it, you know, and that's pretty much how I feel it'd go. If I went back to Europe or England and stayed with some people I know, they'd, you know, no one wants a middle aged man with brain damage and potential emotional problems in their fucking house. No one does. Don't say you fucking do. Don't write in the comments, oh, you could come and stay with me. I don't want to fucking hear it. Yeah. Um, so it either gets better or, uh, I go for the old Remington retirement plan, I guess, you know, or go out to the shoreline and do the YMCA with some fucking glow sticks until the orcs shell me. I don't fucking know, you know. Let's just hope it gets better, you know. I hope the, the days where I feel normal again, which feels great, you know, become more frequent than the days like today where this is making this video is probably the sum total, you know, Eating, having a wash, remembering to brush my teeth and making 10 minute, 15 minute video is the sum total of my achievements today, you know. So, yeah. As for other things about the general Ukraine situation, I would like you all, my three and a half thousand follow followers, to do a thing for me. I would like you to write the Ministry of Defence and your local minister, you know, just do the same email, but change the recipients and tell them that Ukraine's, from my point of view, a drone operator in Kherson, who also speaks to people with other military roles here. Obviously, we need more shells and it'd be nice if the F-16s had turn up now and not like December next year, as they're now saying, right? But what we need right now to hold the line is plastic, is plastic explosives and detonators to make drone bombs and more FPVs. We don't need, like we, we, we do need very, very expensive drones that are made by companies like fucking Raytheon and BAE Systems, yeah. But, you know, they, they don't last that long, those things. They get shot down by, because the Russians will use an actual missile on one of them. And they've got a lot of missiles, right? Um, what we need is normal FPVs and plastic explosives and detonators to make good bombs. Because we've, we've got no end of explosives, but the old, uh, the old, the explosives in a TM-62 anti-tank mine or a, a, a salvaged artillery shell, they basically don't give you enough bang for the kilograms. And when you're talking about something like a drone, you know, a flying object of any sort, every gram matters. So yeah, that's the one thing that's going to help us turn the tide or at least keep the tide at bay, you know, to, to maintain uh, and hold the land we've got for the next year until forces can be built up and the F-16s come in. We need C4 and we need detonators and we need like 100 tonnes of it probably every <laughs> every couple of months, you know. So, yeah, anyway, goodbye from me, Joe McDonald at Big Max Battle Blogs. Goodbye from One Sock. And as always, to our Russian and Vatnik listeners, Idina Hoyzalupa.